Welcome into the checklist, brought to you by Secure Mac. I'm Ken Ray. I'm Nicholas Raba. And I'm Nicholas Tachek. This week, Demystifying Malware Types and Terminology, Part 2. Malware attacks are on the rise. There's more and more news coverage devoted to it. And they'll say things that you know you understand. Things like uh, a major DDoS attack coming from a botnet of IoT devices that took down a DNS server uh, controlling the internet. Now, if you're like me, you'll you'll nod and maybe furrow your brow and say, oh, yeah, that sounds bad. But if you're also like me, you don't know what half that means. Uh, on today's show, we're going to help you make sense of all that security stuff uh, by demystifying the terminology and the acronyms that, um, that you may encounter when listening to or talking about malware. So on today's checklist, making sense of common security terminology, code-related terminology, browser-related terminology, threat-related terminology, and what do all of the acronyms mean? Let's start with some uh, common security terms, gentlemen. Well, you know, as you, you were saying before, with uh, all these reports and news articles on malware attacks as of late or security threats, uh, there's a lot of um, techno babble or you know, security terminology that might not make a whole lot of sense at first glance, but it's really worth investigating and, and kind of learning a bit more about it because once you can recognize what the various terms mean, um, it gives a lot of valuable insight into the capabilities and impact that that particular threat poses. And you can make a you know, better, I guess, an informed decision on whether or not you should freak out. Um, <laughs> so taking a little bit of time to kind of dig deeper with these terms is definitely worth, uh, worth your while. Um, most of the terms can kind of be grouped into one of three categories, uh, code-related terminology, browser-related terminology, or threat-related terminology. Um, each kind of, uh, the, the terms will give information on the different aspects of the threat from how it spreads um, what it can do as far as the capabilities go uh, the severity level of the threat how likely it is to affect you um, so basically uh, give you a better idea of the background of the threat beyond just the name or you know, what major damage is doing kind of how, how's it doing what it's doing what what does that mean for you so then let's start off with the uh, with the top topic or the uh, the top uh, category I suppose the code related terminology Code definitely lies at the heart of every program on your computer, um, your operating system itself. Uh, it's what allows computers to talk to each other over the internet. Um, it forms the basis of the entire internet, actually. Unfortunately, code is also what allows all that malware to do bad things. So some of the common terms that might come up in news reports or articles, um, kind of knowing what they mean definitely um, will give you an idea of, of where the malware is coming from uh, on the code side of things. And the first one, probably the most common one you'll hear in the news, is bug. Um, a bug is basically just a mistake in a piece of computer code, um, usually created by accident. Uh, you know, the programmer was tired or didn't know what they were doing or uh, you know, their hand slipped on the keyboard. Um, and it can cause unexpected behavior with the program. Um, usually a bug will result in the program crashing and you know, the developer will say, oh, I have a bug, I'll fix it. Um, if, if a program, cra like if you're using a program on your computer and it crashes, it usually means, hey, you found a bug. Um, but some of the bugs don't necessarily cause a crash or it might be really hard to trigger the bug. So it's going to go undiscovered for years at times um, until somebody actually takes the time to experiment or look through um, code if the code is open source uh, and realizes the bug is actually there. Uh, attackers, on the other hand, they're going out of their way to look for those bugs. You know, They're trying to find them and they're trying to find bugs that they can use to uh, work as the basis of an exploit. Okay, wait, an exploit. An exploit is when a bug in some computer code is intentionally triggered. Uh, to cause something specific to occur. So uh, from an attacker standpoint, uh, gaining them access they wouldn't otherwise have, uh, reading data they wouldn't normally be able to read, you know, something unexpected that is an advantage to them and usually bad for you. Uh, usually exploits are uh, taking the form of an actual, like the, the attacker will write some computer code that will specifically trigger a bug in some other program or code. Uh, so they're not, you know, they're not doing it by hand. Hollywood isn't isn't uh, really correct when they show the hacker typing at the keyboard and and magically causing all the bad stuff to happen by hand. Um, 
they're they're basically mini programs that are written specifically to cause the bug to happen and on a repeatable basis. Um, it, they'll generally form the basis of how malware can slip past your computer's defenses in the first place. If it's attacking uh, a bug, um, you know, exploit is essentially the the bug being, uh, as the word is, exploited. It's um, it, causing it to have some sort of uh, negative effect that was um, unintended by the original programmers uh, for, for the program that had the bug in it. Okay, forgive me, because we've actually got everything laid out here alphabetically, but immediately when you start talking about bugs, I want to ask about a vulnerability. It sounds to me like a bug could just be something that maybe causes a piece of code or, or an application, let's say, to, to behave in kind of a buggy way, in a way that's not necessarily optimal. But then there are bugs that can actually be vulnerabilities, and those vulnerabilities could be exploited. So... Talk to me about the difference, I suppose, just between just a regular bug and the vulnerability. So remember when we said that some bugs could go undiscovered for years? Yeah. A vulnerability is when a bug is known to exist. It's been determined that it could pose a threat if successfully exploited. Security researchers, they'll alert software vendors when they detect vulnerabilities in their program, giving the vendor a chance to fix the bug before it could be used by bad guys to cause problems. So then we could say that every vulnerability, I mean, unless somebody has actually intentionally written a backdoor for themselves to go back into later, we can say that every vulnerability or most vulnerabilities are bugs, but not all bugs are vulnerabilities. Exactly. If uh, if a bug just causes um, the program to display the wrong font or the wrong color in some text document that's not necessarily a vulnerability um, if a bug could be used to cause um, opening a text document to open a back door on your computer that would be a vulnerability um, a vulnerability uh, one difference to note there between i guess a vulnerability and an exploit would be um, a vulnerability is kind of knowing that a bug exists that has the potential to do something pretty bad but until working code is written that can actually take advantage of that bug in a bad way, it doesn't turn into an exploit until then. So you can have vulnerabilities where it's um, hypothetical or, you know, uh, security researchers saying this could be used in a bad way, but they haven't taken the time to actually make it work fully. Um, and that would constitute uh, a large number of vulnerabilities, um, especially ones that just go where they're reported directly to a vendor and the public never knows about them. You say uh, where the public never knows about them. Something that sort of seems to alarm people sometimes is we'll hear of a proof of concept and people will think, I think I actually talked on the last episode about a family member who got in touch with another family member because she had heard about a giant hack that uh, that had hit Apple. And I think what had actually happened was there was discovery of a proof of concept, but then of course local news gets it and, you know, could your Mac be infected? Well, yeah, technically, yeah, but it's only a proof of concept. Uh, for people who don't know uh, sort of the difference, talk to me if you could about about uh, about proof of concept. So when a security researcher finds a bug um, in a piece of code and they've taken the time to uh, formulate an exploit for that bug, uh, they'll usually, like you know, the good security researchers will usually create it as a proof of concept basically proving that the vulnerability could have um, unintended, unintended uh, consequences if it was exploited. Uh, but proof of concept usually doesn't leave the lab. If anything, they'll send it to the vendor saying, hey, here's proof that my vulnerability um, could do bad things. Um, now take a look at what it does and fix the problem. Uh, when it doesn't leave the lab, it's not out in the wild. Um, sometimes security researchers will release a proof of concept out to the general public. Um, usually in those cases, they kind of hobble it. They take out the, you know, the infectious agent of it. They, they make it so it's benign and it doesn't, it can't be used without significant modification to do bad stuff. Um, again, they're generally created just to prove that a vulnerability uh, can be successfully exploited because uh, not all bugs and vulnerabilities can be, uh, causing major problems like we see when when you hear about hacks in the news so there are two more terms that we're going to hit here uh both of which sound kind of scary actually one sounds scarier i think than maybe it should although maybe you'll get me to the proper level of freak out uh, talk to me about the term zero day 
sometimes security researchers will choose to release full details on a particular vulnerability without alerting the software vendor that they have a problem in the first place. Um, other times, the bad guys were the ones who found the vulnerability and wrote an exploit for it. Uh, you know, security researchers didn't know about it either. Um, in either case, the end result is what's considered a zero-day vulnerability. It means the software vendor has had no forewarning about the threat, they had no idea it existed, and have thus had zero days to fix the issue. Uh, they're basically uh, the basis of some of the most damaging malware and are considered a severe threat because it's, fixing bugs takes time. Um, it, generally, when you're talking about some of the major software vendors, Apple, Google, um, Facebook, they'll request sometimes six months or a year to fix a bug. Good grief. So, yeah, yeah. because, I mean, if you think about it, it, just for the normal, all the testing and development that has to go into a, a normal uh, update to an operating system, when you're talking about going back and fixing a piece of code that's broken, but that fix might affect a bunch of other code that needs to be fixed then, um, depending on the severity of the threat, it can take a while because they want to make sure they're completely fixing the problem and not making things worse. So when you have something kind of released into the wild with no forewarning, the vendor's completely blindsided by it, You know they're going to scramble all the developers they can to get on that problem and start working on a fix right away. But until they have a fix ready, you know, any bad guy with access to the exploit code can be causing all sorts of problems um, around the internet, on people's computers, you know, anything they want to do. So it's a very dangerous time between when a zero day appears and when the vendor actually is able to implement and distribute a fix. And then you actually just hit on the other term that uh, strikes me as maybe a tiny bit more scary than the zero day, um, and that is in the wild. So in the wild refers to malware that's been found outside of a security researcher's lab. Um, these are things that are are out there in the public. Mm -hmm. Most of the researchers, they'll they'll work with their proof of concept. It's in a controlled environment. They're working with it. They're able to report it. But when you see it in the wild, that means it's out there. It, it's no longer hypothetical. You know, it's it's not an experiment at that point. It means, you know, it's the real deal. It's out there and anybody who has access to it can use it for, you know, bad or for good, but usually for bad when you're talking about malware and exploits. So zero day is scary. In the wild is scary. A zero day in the wild, well then, it's just time to hide. <laughs> okay, may maybe not hide, but I mean that's that's the scariest combination of the ones that you've mentioned so far. Yes, it sounds it is. okay. Okay, all right. So we've covered some of the code uh, related terminology. Let's move on to discuss terms uh, associated with threats um, that we might hit just browsing the web. So, a browser hijacker. It's mostly associated with adware. A browser hijacker is anything that makes unwanted changes to your web browser, um, adding a toolbar, changing your home page, changing your search settings, redirecting you from one web page to another, or displaying ads or any of the pop-ups that occur. And, and just so we're clear, we're talking specifically now about you're going online. These are things that you might encounter. I mean, everything else that we talked about were, were basically... Anything that you could be doing on your computer could be affected. And when we're talking about the browser-related terminology, we're talking specifically about um, uh, about surfing, right? While you're surfing the internet, exactly. All right, all right. And some of some of these terms for the web browsing-related terms are you know more annoying than than problematic, but some have um, I guess more of a, an impact on your security or privacy. So it's good to be aware of the differences between them. Not unlike malware, which we talked about, um, well, which we talked about a few times. Uh, malvertising is an is an ugly combination of words. It's a bit more recent, and yeah, it kind of looks a little jarring. Uh, a combination of the words malicious and advertising. Um, basically, it's when legitimate online ad networks are used to spread malware. Um, sometimes, usually it's the case of like JavaScript, um, sometimes the ad itself contains malicious code, and the ad itself is what's basically exploiting a bug and doing bad stuff to your system. Uh, other times, um, the ad 
uh, the, you know, mal- malvertising ad is just used to get you to download a separate piece of malware onto um, your, your computer and run it. So those you need to download this virus scanner because you're infected and you need to run the scan. You know, those are uh, examples of malvertising in action where the ad itself isn't causing a problem, but you're downloading something the ad's promoting and that's what causes the problem. So let's move into phishing. Phishing is one of the most common ones. You'll get this when when you mistype a website address or when you receive that email telling you that your account's been suspended. It tricks you into thinking, oh, I gotta type in I gotta type in my username, password. It'll trick you into giving confidential data like your credit card number or social security number. It basically makes you think that you're at the at the company's website, the trusted company's website, when really you're not. You mistyped a domain name. You ended up at PayPal, which maybe you added an extra L to it, or whatever bank account uh, website you have. This is one of the most common ones out there. Most of the time, uh, phishing attempts are kind of sent indiscriminately to a bunch of users at once, they they all get the same message. You know, your bank account is going to be closed. Well, you might not even have um, an account with that specific bank. Uh, but sometimes um, f- the fishers will be a little more uh, research oriented, and they'll take the time to research your name, your occupation, you know, some internal information about your company, and they'll target you more specifically with some details that might make you trust. Uh, their message a bit more and maybe fall for it. Uh, that's called spear phishing. And that also gets a bit into the whole human engineering angle, right? Exactly. Yeah. And if you don't know what that is, well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are movies that talk about it, but I mean, it basically is there are those who say that the weakest link in any you know uh, organization security is the person who's using it. I mean, if you can be tricked into giving up a few different things, like we talked about a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about building a secure website, uh, not secure website, I'm sorry, building a secure password and making sure you have a strong and secure password. You know, if you're at the bus stop and you're talking to somebody about your cute little dog, Sparky, now they may think, okay, well, Sparky may be that person's uh, password. I mean, so that's, I mean, that's a combination of um, of uh, of human engineering and, and phishing, it seems to me. Exactly. You know, talking to you guys makes me more and more frightened every week. <laughs> <laughs> We're not trying to make you more frightened. We're just trying to enlighten you and make you more aware. I know. Knowledge is power and knowing is half the battle. I know. I know. S- sometimes I've, I've actually wondered, um, when you see friends on Facebook filling out those surveys where the survey questions are all kind of somewhat personal like where did you grow up where did you go to school you know name the person you're married to and you have to sit there and you go is this you know really legitimate or is this just some elaborate you know social engineering attempt where uh these survey people are gathering lots of information <laughs> probably not but you know i never fill those out and i actually kind and of and it's it really is amazing to see how many people will fill those out yeah what type of information people just give away all by themselves. Hey, look, I bought a new house. Here's the key to my house. Congratulations to me. <laughs> Sorry, that's a horrible idea. A picture <laughs> of the key to your house. That's, yeah, okay. Let, let's move on to, well, again, we're, we're trying to arm ourselves with knowledge so that we won't fall victim, I suppose. God, that sounds, that sounds so militaristic. Tracking cookies. Uh, tracking cookies are actually one that kind of... Um, Every website you go to has a cookie policy stated at the top, and and if you're like most people, you don't read it, um, and 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 certainly not every, well, I think not every site that uses cookies is using tracking cookies. Talk to me about, uh, I guess, talk to me about the difference, I suppose, between cookies and tracking cookies, and then what are the um, what are the problems or the the things to be aware of with tracking cookies? Sure. So every time you visit a site, uh, information about that visit stored in the form of a cookie. Um, for tracking purposes, um, it can actually have a useful purpose. Say you know, you're on Amazon and you've filled out some stuff in your cart and you're about to check out and you hit the wrong key and close that tab. Um, without the benefits of tracking cookies, you'd have to you know, basically re-add all those items to your cart. Thankfully, you just reopen the tab and Amazon's tracking cookie says, hey, here's what was in your cart and your cart's filled up again and you can just finish your checkout. Saves you time. Uh, so 
very beneficial aspects to them. They are the things that remember your username when you're you know, logging into a, a forum. Um, if you're going to Apple discussion boards, for example, you don't have to necessarily log in every single time because a cookie's keeping that session active. Uh, there are definitely good purposes for them. Convenient. Yeah, convenient purposes. And they can also be used, though, by online advertisers to track, record, mine data about your web browsing habits. Um, you know, when you're surfing the web and you feel like a specific ad is following you around from site to site, you're like, you know, what's going on here? That's a uh, tracking cookie in action. Um, so they can, you know, it definitely isn't a security threat that's super high on the list, but it can be a privacy concern for some users, especially when you're talking about these um, profiles that the ad companies are building uh, as you surf the web. You know, they might know more about you than you know about yourself. So it's one of those things where um, they can have privacy implications. So definitely one to be aware of. And let's say you're shopping for the holidays. You know, it conveniently remembers what you added to your cart. But if you don't have separate profiles or user accounts and everybody shares the same machine, well, your kids may see what they're getting as a gift as well <laughs> just by surfing the Internet. Hey, we saw you looked at this. Right. You may be interested in these other things as well. Wow. But then a 21st century kid can sort of leave you a, a shopping list without you realizing they're leaving a shopping list. <laughs> Subliminal messaging. Exactly. Wow. Why is this Why is this 4 by 4 driven by a six-year-old keep showing up on all the websites I go to. <laughs> I really want this drone, Dad. I really want it. <laughs> Actually, there's an interesting point with um, with regards to kids and tracking cookies. Um, recently, a lot of the big uh, toy toy vendor sites were, there was a big, uh, I, I don't really know if you could call it class action, but they got in trouble with the government because they were tracking um, kids on the websites when that's specifically not allowed. And so they had to pay fines and change their website design so tracking cookies weren't being used anymore for those kids' sites. No, for kids' sites, but they wouldn't necessarily know if it's a kid or an adult that's on there. And that's Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing. that I think that's one of the defenses. You know, who, How do we know who's using the computer? <laughs> well, then again, if you've got a bunch of 35-year-olds using a site that's you know made for 11- or 12-year-olds, you've got a whole other set of issues there. <laughs> exactly. Uh, are you sure I'm not supposed to be frightened every time we do the show? Yes, I know. Okay, let's move on. We've talked about uh, code-related terminology. We've talked about browser-related terminology. Uh, we're going to get into some threat-related terminology here. Um, we covered a bunch of the main categories last week when it comes to different malware types, uh, but let's let's go a bit more into the uh, threat-related terms. So let's start talking about backdoors. Okay. A backdoor... It's a way for someone to access a computer or a program, a website that falls outside of the usual methods, such as logging in with the username and password. Most often, bad guys use malware to set up back doors on infected systems, allowing them to gain access again at a later time, remote access. Other times, back doors, they're intentionally added by vendors to legitimate software usually to facilitate an easy user support experience, uh, remotely reset a password for a user, or you're having trouble with your, your cable modem firewall that you configured yourself um, because you are an advanced user and you're calling in for support because the internet is broken. Okay, I couldn't quite hear it. When you say you're an advanced user, it sounded like your tongue may have been in your cheek there. <laughs> well, I mean, when when companies, they try to offer the best support for users, sometimes the easiest way is to take control of the device again. So a lot of different hardware has remote access or ways for for the tech support or the administrators to to gain access again to help the user out. It's protecting the users from themselves. If they get into a situation that they can't fix, that, that the end user can't fix on their own or can't uh, be fixed easily by walking through it on the phone with a tech support person, it's kind of like tech support throwing up their hands and saying, I'll just do it myself. Um, they don't have to go to that user's computer physically. They can just do it remotely. And you know, these kind of backdoors, um, 
yes, yeah, sometimes sometimes there there's documentation um, that they exist, or you know, it's if it's if the system's owned by whatever company, they can do whatever they want with it. Um, it's one of those things that can kind of be used for good and for bad. Uh, if a third, you know, a malicious third party finds out about a backdoor that a company has in a piece of software, that's usually bad news because then they're getting into some system, um, and the company probably never expected that they'd figure it out. So here's one that I know we've heard in the news recently, and I think we actually used it in the example at the top of the show as well, uh, either a bot or a botnet. So botnets have definitely been in the news a lot. Um, pretty much the big thing right now is rather than having access to one computer or one device, why not have access to hundreds of thousands or millions of devices? Um, so some types of malware take complete control of infected machines, turning them into bots. Sometimes the computers are referred to as zombies. A botnet is a large collection of these infected machines, um, all under control of, of one attacker or, or one person out there able to do something on a larger scale, whether it be sending spam or participating in a distributed denial of service attack. We're hearing more and more about botnets being used to take down websites, um, to cause disruption to networks. And the really strange thing about this, too, I mean, you think, okay, when you say things like, you know, taking over and starting a botnet, something like that, you would think you would need a fairly powerful machine to do something fairly complex. And while it's true that you might need a whole army of powerful machines to do something very complex... If you've got something like an internet-connected camera or something like that, which is not the most complex machine, I mean, first of all, it's probably a lot more complex than people realize, but it's still not complex enough to do, like, you know, some truly horrifying stuff. At the same time, they can be used to gum up the works pretty effectively. Yeah, it's connected to a network, and a lot of these networks have a lot of bandwidth behind them. Um, but it's not really dial-up anymore for users. People are on a higher speed connections and being able to take advantage of those devices and those networks all at once is is a huge thing. It's kind of like you're turning all these infected machines, these individual infected machines into a giant infected supercomputer and using the power of all those machines, all the devices, all that bandwidth um, with one intent. And that, that when you multiply the capabilities of any one individual uh, device that's infected there, and you're multiplying it by however many are infected, millions, hundreds of thousands, that's where the real power of a botnet comes from. Right. Again, we're talking about a numbers game. I mean, like, I, I don't want to spoil it because I know where we're going, but when you're talking about a denial of service attack, which we'll get to in a moment, all that really is doing is it's knocking on the door and saying, let me into this service. And there's no problem if you have one camera knocking on the door saying, let me into this service. The problem was, you know, is when you have a million of them doing it all at once. I mean, it's, it's so, I mean, you're not looking at the most sophisticated thing in the world, but you're, you're doing it in such huge numbers that even something that's fairly unsophisticated um, can wreak a lot of havoc, which, you know, we'll get to in just a bit. I want to talk, though, another, about another term before we get to that, uh, the command and control server. So for, for these, these infected machines that are part of a botnet, uh, in, or, in order for them to know what bad thing they're supposed to be doing, they need uh, a centralized system that can issue commands to them, you know, saying, mm -hmm. hey, attack this website, or hey, send this you know, f fake pharmaceutical spam. Um, so the computer system that's in charge of a botnet that's controlling it is the command and control server. Um, sometimes known as a CNC server or a C2 server. Um, basically, that's the brains of the botnet. That's the, the thing that's controlling the hive mind that is a botnet, that's issuing the commands, that can tell it what to do. Um, so those, those actually are the, the big targets when you're talking about efforts to take down a botnet. A lot of times the security vendors will go after the command and control servers because if you can take that out, you're, you're cutting the head off the botnet and it doesn't have any commands to follow it just doesn't have anything to do all right so we've covered some code related terminology we've covered some browser related terminology we've covered some uh some threat related terminology what's cool about terminology is its terms 
Right. I mean, botnet is short for a couple of other things. Malware is an amalgamation of some other things. Uh, where it might get a little bit more confusing for people is when you just start throwing out letters and numbers. Um, we talked earlier about a DNS. We talked about a DOS or DDOS. We talked about an IoT. So we're actually going to go in through some of those as well and uh, and, and put actual terms uh, to those um, shortened terms. Uh, start with the DNS, if you would. Sure thing. DNS stands for Domain Name System. Uh, it's basically the underlying technology that translates those easy-to-remember domain names like apple.com into the uh, numerical format. It's more machine-friendly and used when routing traffic around the Internet. So kind of, uh, you know, what's giving directions on, hey, apple.com points to this actual server, uh, core component of what makes the Internet work the way it does. That's crazy because, like, when I look at a map, what I'm looking for is Maple Street, but there is a way to look at it where you're looking at latitude, longitude, and, you know, even smaller numbers than that. That's basically what you're saying, right? Apple.com is not anything that a machine would understand, but Apple.com is me saying, okay, this is the road I want to get to, and the machine's putting me at the proper latitude and longitude or putting me at the proper string of numbers. It's going to get me to the information I want. Exactly. Okay. One that's been in the news uh, recently Again, uh, the DOS or DDOS attack. Um, DOS, DDOS, can you tell me what those mean? Denial of service, DOS, and DDOS is distributed denial of service. This is the attack to make a computer, a network, a website, or whatever it may be, inaccessible to other users. It's, it's attacking it. Um, the distributed denial of service attack is multiple computers, how we mentioned a botnet, um, everybody trying to attack it all at once. The first time I heard somebody talk about a DDoS attack, or a DOS attack, I guess, was in 2000. And somebody was trying to say exactly, how, like, what is it? We didn't, we couldn't, like, get a clear idea of how to explain it to people. And and one of the security people we were talking to said, okay, imagine trying to get into 7-Eleven to buy something but you can't get in the door because it looks like there are a bunch of people there, but there are actually no people there. And it's not, it's not exactly as illustrative as you want it to be, except that the point is there's a bunch of fake traffic trying to get to where you're trying to go. And so nobody can get to what you're trying to get to because there are all these, these fake attempts uh, to, to basically overload the entrance, right? Exactly. The server doesn't know how to differentiate between legitimate traffic and the fake traffic. You know, everybody's knocking on the door, as you said before, and the server doesn't know what's you know a real person and what's something that's just an infected piece of a botnet. And so it grinds to a halt. You know, too many requests at once, and it can't give information to anybody. Someday I want to ask you about what that grinding to a halt actually looks like. Like, you know, is the thing itself melting down? Is it trying to is it still process all of these requests? Is it just shutting down because there are too many requests? But let's not do that today. I, I said a minute ago that so that the, the DDoS attack or the DOS attack might be, you know, a bunch of fake attempts, but the fake attempts have to come from real things. Uh, one of the DDoS attacks that was in the news in the past couple of weeks was a DDoS attack or a de uh, distributed denial of service attack that was executed by IoT devices. So what's IoT? Internet of Things, IoT. So that's pretty much any device that is somehow connected to the network or Internet. Um, and we love technology. So we try to connect everything, right? I mean, Apple has their cool home functionality that that could help turn on light bulbs and help automate things. We're seeing more and more devices connected to the Internet. I have light bulbs that connect to the internet. They have refrigerators that connect to the internet, and you could control these things from your phone. Cars connect to the internet. There's a lot of technology that connects to the internet. So these are considered IoT devices, Internet of Things. It's kind of like um, the things you wouldn't normally think of as being connected to the internet. You think of your computer and your smartphone, your printer as normal things, but the variety of devices that connect now um, from TVs to, you know, internet cam, uh, webcams, you know, stuff like that, it's um, pretty diverse. And the problem is that for a lot of these smart devices, security was not a priority when they were being developed. And so we're seeing a lot of 
problems stemming from that now. Next, uh, the next set of acronyms, uh, PUA or PUP? Uh, PUA stands for Potentially Unwanted Application, and PUP stands for Potentially Unwanted Program. Pretty much the same thing, interchangeable acronyms. Um, they refer to software that's not overtly malicious. You know, it's not necessarily super bad, but it also might not be something you actually want installed on your system. Um, most of the time, they'll come bundled alongside a program you do want, so kind of like a Trojan horse, but more like it's a, an extra passenger that you weren't expecting. Um, a lot of times, the only reference to those potentially unwanted programs uh, are in the software license agreement that nobody ever reads that they just click through. <laughs> um, right. You know, so those are things that you probably didn't actually expect or want on your computer, but they're not, you know, they're not going to lock your files and hold them for ransom. You know, they're not that bad, but possibly you don't want them. Last acronym that we're going to hit. Um, am I saying R A T or am I saying RAT? You know, I've I've heard uh, I've heard it differently from different people. A lot of people just say RAT. Um, sure, but it, you know, it's not a, a supercharged version of the computer mouse. Um, it is a remote access tool. Uh, you know, pretty self-evident there. It allows you to remotely access a computer. Um, unlike a back door that might be kind of a hidden feature, uh, most of the remote access tools are legitimate third-party apps or built directly into the operating system. Um, back to my Mac is one example. Um, anything that can be used to uh, connect from one computer to another, screen sharing, uh, anything like that. And it you know, allows you to perform remote technical support or access your home computer when you're on the road. Um, they can also be used, obviously, for nefarious purposes. Uh, a lot of the tech support scams have been using remote access tools where they'll take control of the victim's computer, make it look like there's a bunch of bad stuff going on, tell the user, pay me $400, I'll fix it, make look like they're doing a bunch of good stuff and call it a day. And they didn't actually do anything. Uh, they just used it as a tool to scam the user. Um, so obviously there are some cases where there's legitimate uses and some where it's less than legitimate legitimate uses. So then armed with our, our, our newfound knowledge, uh, let's try the sentence that we did uh, at the top again. Uh, most recently, the headlines were focused on a major DDoS attack uh, coming from a botnet of IoT devices that took down the DNS servers controlling the internet. So, one of you guys want to translate that in ways that we can now all understand? Okay. Well, the first step, let's uh, expand the acronyms. So, a major distributed denial of service attack coming from a botnet of Internet of Things devices that took down the domain name system servers controlling the internet. Uh, from there, um, basically comes out to a bunch of malware-infected smart devices were actively working together to block access to a key component of the internet. So it makes a little bit more sense once you can understand the underlying terminology and acronyms that are used. Um, and when you can read a sentence like that in the news and break it down into its component parts, say, hey, okay, I have a better idea of what's going on now. Um, definitely uh, makes it a bit easier to digest and understand what security news is yeah, something to be concerned about and what you know, what can affect you and what's something you shouldn't lose any sleep over. But here's the question. Were you a part of this DDoS attack? Was your IoT device that you had running on your home network part of it? <laughs> that is the question. <laughs> it's not a question we're going to be able to hit today, I don't think. Although... If you have questions, well, let me, let, me, let me do a couple of things really quickly. I mean, first of all, we covered a lot of information today, and a lot of it, yeah, you remember right now what a DDoS, what that stands for, but will you remember in 15 minutes, 20 minutes tomorrow? Remember this. The website for this show is uh, securemac.com slash checklist, and you can find show notes uh, not only for past shows, but also for this show as well. So if you want to take another look at some of the terminology that we covered today, securemac.com slash checklist. And then if you have a question like, okay, Nick and Nick, how do I know whether I was part of this? Uh, you might want to send that question by email. And the email is checklist at securemac.com. Uh, the email address again is checklist at securemac.com. And if you can't remember that, remember this. You are listening to The Checklist, brought to you by Secure Mac. And we'll talk to you next week. 